40 minutes. It's a bit of a spin the dice and we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> What a, it has been a busy week and I volunteered to do this talk like last Tuesday, so we're flying by the seat of our pants. But I did want to give a bit of a talk just to kind of give a beginner's insight into the kind of ways that I like to write code at work. So theoretically I should be able to talk about this. Uh, if I can't then there's a problem. Uh, but if there's anything weird in the slides or that doesn't make sense, I haven't looked at how small the code is, so maybe that will be completely legible. We'll see. Uh, just pick, just, just uh, let me know and we'll answer questions. There's plenty of time, so heckle or ask me questions, whatever you need to do. Uh, a little about me, a little bit about me and my employer since they sponsored the pizza tonight, so I should probably talk about them. Uh, we write tools that help create content on the web. Primarily, our WYSIWYG HTML editors are the way that we go about that. HoneyMC is one of them. Uh, Textbox is another one. And writing one of those and gluing all the APIs and doing all the thing in content editable and having all these events flow through the editor and all that kind of stuff is really hard. Uh, our job is probably less hard, but it's a, pr it's, a pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty tough job. And we rely on FP to kind of tame the complexity of our world to, to, to make sense of it and to help us write code. Uh, and especially with George and I, because we're like two people trying to write the services for all of these editors yeah. and somehow they work. So it's a good, it's a good story. But we are hiring because we would like more than two developers on the services team. <laughs> um, we, are, <laughs> we are hiring for uh, the editor spots as well, so if you uh, that kind of person that is masochistic and wants to try FP and JavaScript and try and make a rich text editor work, then that is your job because it does sound fun. Uh, or you can, or, or you can work on the back end services team with George and I. Um, our stuff's a bit more tame. It's more akin to what we're doing here because you can't do all of this in JavaScript. And hopefully, this talk should hopefully do that. So what's functional programming? It's, it's a style of programming that allows us to make trade-offs about things. We can, we can, the whole idea is to maximize our ability to safely compose things. And we do that by weakening what we can do in our functions to allow our callers to do more. Because um, if, if, we, if we have a type that says, I can only do these three things rather than a type like any to unit, which could do anything, or in a perfect world, it would do nothing. Um, it, <laughs> anyone says actors, I will kill you because my busy week has been spray and Acker's fault. Cool, man. It's system.exits when it sees a fatal error. I'm sure it does. <laughs> Any of you, man. Why is WebSphere crashing? Acker decided to kill the world. Anyhow, we don't want to write code like that. We're trying to write it like this. Um, we really want the ability to look at our types, and I, I'm gonna, this is going to be really ranty. It probably shouldn't go on the internet. <laughs> Anyhow, you're the one who edits this. <laughs> um, but we, we really want to be able to look at that type and re figure out whether it's safe to compose with other functions, and to be able to do that, and then do that to the things that we compose under that, and keep going, and not have that fall off the rails because we forgot about this effect or but this thing's mutable or it needs this global or whatever. We don't want to deal with that anymore. Um, and in large pieces of software, this is really the challenging spot. Writing a little function is pretty easy. Figuring out whether that fits in the macro level system or whether you can take this module and this module and put them together, that's the hard part. Anybody who's tried to refactor Perl code, maybe, maybe you've done that with the Perl code. I'm currently doing that. Yeah. Um, it's pretty, it's, you get scared. You, you can't load everything up in your head and figure out what is safe to change. Too much state mutation. Yeah. Or you just spend your time in a debugger trying to figure out why the hell the tests are failing. Um, and because we spend so much time in this software maintenance, I really want to live in a world where I'm optimizing for this part, the, the high level reasoning about code. Sure, my individual functions might be harder to write because they're now pure and I can't have a var or a global, I can't cheat. But the hard stuff becomes easier, which 
if you take anything away from this and want to get excited about functional programming, that's what I want you to take away. Um, NFP is just one tool. You can do FP in pretty much every any language. People have tried it in Java. It kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> we try to do it in Scala. It kind of works. Um, you can apply these principles everywhere. It's just you might not have all the tools in the programming language to help you get all the way there. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to walk through that. We're going to walk through how we can use those types to kind of weaken what we can do to strengthen other bits and get this reasonability. Um, the goal of this talk is to kind of, I'm going to hand wave this part, I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> I, that's a really old joke. I, I probably shouldn't keep that joke going. Um, um, just a, a kind of, you're going to have to get up here and, meet and watch my enthusiasm and just assume that I'm talking about something that makes sense and that you can do this stuff. But we'll get to that. Uh, if, you, if you want to know about anything about how you can do these things, that's what this group is for. So we'll talk about that later. This is more about me getting up, ranting, making people excited. Hopefully I can do that. Uh, and really the, the focus is going to be on how types and how abstractions play the part in this, not how we actually do anything. Um, so yeah, if it doesn't make sense, put your hand up, ask questions. Uh, and I thought I was going to add this in, but I'm explicitly not going to put much code in here. It's just going to be types. We're thinking with types and functions and how that goes. So I think there's only a few bits of code. So if that is confusing and that was a mistake, let me know and we can get the additional context. But the whole goal of this talk is to get to a world where all we need is that type. We shouldn't need to look at the function. So hopefully it gets the point across. If it doesn't, then I guess it's all a failure and we shouldn't do this, but we'll see. Uh, we're going to start off with referential transparency. Um, <clears throat> for a function to be referentially, referentially transparent or pure, it, I think there's a formal definition, but the, the definition that I like to use is that it always returns the same output for a given input. Uh, and it should not have an observable effect on the program if that function is called once, twice, none, 50 times, it shouldn't make a difference. So really, we are ta we're talking about the fact that the output is completely substitution substitutable for the running of the function itself. Um, so the things that we can't do then is we can't close over mutable state. If we can somehow return a different result because of some mutable variable we have in scope, like a random number generator or something weird like that. We're not in a pure, we're not in a pure function anymore. And we can't kind of have any function where we're having an effect on the program other than just returning that value. And we'll get to that later and obviously we write to databases and files and all that kind of stuff. So we need to handle that. But we're just talking about pure functions right now. We have tricks, we'll get to it later. Um, but for all these kind of pain points, and they are pain points when you first do functional programming, it's hard, you're like, what do I do? This is completely weird, why don't I just write Java or Python or whatever, because that's what I'm used to. But you do get some things, you, you get the ability to look at that function, its inputs and outputs, and have a pretty good idea of what it does. We don't have dependent types, so we can't get all of the way there, maybe one day. But right now we don't, but we can get a pretty good way through not having an idea of what this does and what it doesn't. I think what it doesn't do is more important than what it is doing. Um, and we'll get to that. But we can now write abstractions that take those, the freedoms that we have about that function and really take them to the nth degree. Because we don't have to worry about it mutating something or returning a different value or whatever. The things that we build on top of this uh, suddenly have more control over how this is run, how it's not run, etc., etc. Uh, and ways that this comes about is the, the the cliched one is parallelism. If we give control over to something else to run this code, and it doesn't have any effect if we run it on four cores or five cores, doesn't really matter. We can get those nice effects of running it on multiple cores without worrying about that catching fire because there's some weird side effect. 
We can write our own control structures, and you see this in Haskell all the time. We have these crazy monad things, and then we write our own control structures to say, if this condition happens, then do this, and it's all, it's all nice, and we can handle that in user space rather than being part of the language, which is pretty cool to have that kind of control. And lazy evaluation is one, um, another one, like streaming, that kind of thing. Anytime you, you give up control of evaluating your program to something else, it has to be pure because you can't guarantee that it'll be called or when it's called or anything like that. So that's, that's pretty powerful. But why is this important? Now this is too small, isn't it? Oh, it was always gonna be too small. Let's see if I can fix this. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> JavaScript. That's all right. That's all right. That looks alright. Um, consider these two functions, swizzle and swaggle. If we have something that takes these two functions and takes the output, it doesn't work. Um, takes the output of swizzle and feeds it into swaggle and returns the boolean. I have a question, Ben. There's, you've got string and int there, and there's an arrow between them. What does that arrow mean? Good question, George. I should remember when I'm giving a talk that's supposed to be beginner level and actually explain syntax. Good question. This is the function name. On the right-hand side of these double colons is the type that we expect that variable. In this case, it's a function that takes a string and then returns an int. Uh, swaggle is, a, is another value that is a function that takes an int and then a boolean, and then foo is string to boolean. Okay. This triple greater than is the machinery that I was talking about to take this function here, run it, take the output, and feed it into here. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> If Swizzle, Swizzle and Swaggle weren't pure and they could do whatever the hell they wanted, they could mutate things, they could return a different value the second time you call it, to reason about foo, we'd have to carry those effects and weird things about these two functions in our head to reason about foo. And that's a problem because we just we want to be able to look at the types here and look at the types here and not have any other context that we have to load in our head. Because every time you come to this code, if we were in a world where we could compose functions that had side effects, you would have to look at Swizzle and Swaggle and go, crap, they mutate things. I should remember that when I call foo. I should be careful. And we probably go into a world where we call this Swizzle Swaggle or something crazy like that that kind of says, hey, remember, this thing is crazy. It's called Swizzle Swaggle. It's obviously crazy. You need to remember something when you change it. You need to load this information up into your brain. And this, this kind of works when it all fits on one page, but when you're dealing with big code bases that are 100,000 lines of JavaScript, like we have at work, and you're working over here, and then you're trying to work over here, thinking about all those things is just impossible. It's not going to happen. So we don't want to do that. Because we will eventually get to the point where our ability to compose things and refactor, refactor things is limited by our brains rather than just looking at the types. And my brain is pretty puny, so I don't want to spend unnecessary time in a debugger or limit the expressibility and abstraction of my code just to deal with the fact that I'm not the smartest person in the world. I don't want to have to deal with that. Don't have a lot of registers. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's make this better. The x86 of brains. Yes. This is like, I think there's three of them at most. And one returns a faulty result every now and then. Um, so we really want to get to this point where we, instead of thinking, th thinking of things as statements and imperative things, we want to think of things as an algebra of computation. Um, we just want to think of these pure functions that just take inputs and just take outputs, and that's the only context that I have to think of. That the, the output values of those functions are completely substitutable by compared to calling the function itself. Because um, this, this gives the caller lots of freedoms. And when you think that, that 
the core is our brain at some points because we have to load all this stuff up into our head and think about it and go, that's not going to work, change this. Um, that's a pretty big cognitive overhead for you to deal with large-scale programs. If you're just doing simple REST APIs, maybe you're not worried about this so much, but when things get big, I don't want to have to think about these things because um, I want to just be able to make a change and then push it to production and know that with the types, I've reasoned about this enough to know that it's going to work. Um, sometimes it doesn't work, but it's not going to be fundamental, oh my goodness, this is null pointer exception for some reason, or system exiting. Why would it system exit? Don't do that. Um, yeah, so because really I want to get to a world where the, our ability to reason about that code and our ability to compose and abstract over things is linked to the power of our types. So I really want to talk about the kind of entry level things that we do in things like Scala or PureScript and Haskell that make reasoning about these types better. Um, ah, here's my little note. I'm going to avoid writing anything but type signatures. And it's going to be a journey of just trying to think about the types, where the holes in that are, and just getting, trying to get an intuition for this kind of thought and programming. At this point, are there any questions? Because this is a good point to just stop, chill out. If, the, if I've left anybody behind or anything, now's the time to catch up. Right. I'm just going to pause for a second and chill out. No, I can stop. <laughs> All right. So the, the core tool and the, the basic building block of just even just something as simple as coding in Scala, maybe it's not the best language in the world for FP. You call it simple. This, these simple things that I'm going to talk about that you can do in Scala, they make programming in Scala pleasurable, even though you might not be able to get like full-blown FP, sometimes it gets in your road. But these tricks are pretty cool. I just want to talk about them. It's all about just if there's an input to your function is, that is not going to happen and is outside of your assumptions, it shouldn't be in the type. Oh, this is going to be fun. More codes here. Yeah. I gotta remember what's control. All right. I'm going to call everything Fuzzlebutt just because that's funny. Um, what's wrong with this type signature? What can a, type, a, a function from string to string do? And I guess the, as long as this is all of this exercise is on the assumption that it's pure. So forget that we're we're out of totally crazy town where we can have unbridled side effects. Even if it's pure, what other kinds of things can th this function do? And there are really an infinite number of implementations to this function. You, well, bounded by the memory you have and the string that you can fit into that memory. But theoretically infinite numbers of implementations of this. And that's just crazy. <sighs> I'll figure out a reveal one day. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like we're back when we didn't have purity. We're like, well, what does string to string do? I have no idea. Let's look at the code. And at this point, I think we've lost. I don't like to write code like this. Because uh, all the things that we were trying to do, we've gone to all this trouble to make things referentially transparent, and then we hit a type signature like this, and you're like, pass me with a real shithead. Um, that is not good. Um, some functions, like two uppercase, are kind of impossible to have anything but this signature. And that's kind of okay, but those kind of, if we need to call it to uppercase to convey this point to somebody, that's okay, but it should only be the last result. This should not be the, the de facto mode of programming, because I don't want to have to deal with fuzzle butts. Uh, I think we can do much better. <laughs> Um, take an equally bad thing. Something called clean log line. We now have an expectation of what it does. We shouldn't really listen to that, but it's, it's string to string. That's bad. What could we do better? Um, if we're cleaning it, we obviously have some idea of how, how it's structured. We have some kind of expectation of how it's shaped. 
So we should make that a data type. This is pretty simple and boring, but this is just the journey, so bear with me. Um, I'll go pretty quickly after this. If we can make this some kind of product that denotes the things that we expect in this thing, so there's some kind of time, there's some, some kind of system code, severity and message, we can now improve our type by saying, hey, now it's a string to a log line. Yes, we haven't saved anything because we still have all these strings in here and we still have an infinite number of implementations of that function. That's okay, we're on a journey. It's a smaller infinity. It is. Well, it's not. It's the same infinity. It's four times infinity, which is infinity. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the three or two infinities. And five's right out. Can we compare infinities? Not Are we directly. in that kind of weird branch of mathematics? Um, Transfinite induction on my strings. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Um, uh, even at this place where it's still crappy, we've, we've communicated our shape a little bit better. So I, I think we've still won, even though I wouldn't like to see code like this. Um, let's move into some types. We've talked about product types. When we talk about product types, we're talking about a, a structure that can take a whole, like A, B, C, and D, and be the product of all of those types. So that's why when I was saying here, this is a product of string, 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 and string, so it's really string, which is infinity times four. Uh, I think that's right. I'm tired. To the power of four, it could be to the power of four. It doesn't really matter because it's big. infinity. It's big. Uh, but let's, let's, let's do what we can to reduce our expectations of the type by looking at a thing called some types. And annoyingly, a lot of, there are a lot of languages that don't have some types which I find really sad. I would pretty much, like having some types is the minimal thing that I would want. Enums get you partially there. No, they don't. We will get to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a very little way. <laughs> it's better than not enums. Uh, do I have to make that bigger? Are we good? Uh, is, can you kind of read that? It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. All right. I don't uh, it's probably fine. How's it look for the camera? Uh, it's hard to tell on the small screen. Screens are good. Doesn't it? Sorry? <laughs> it does say strings are good. Uh, we can change our severity to instead of being a string, we actually have a data type that can construct into a constructor called debug. Uh, when we talk about a data type, um, we talk about this being the type here, like a type called severity, that's the same as a type called string. And everything here, separated by pipes, is a way to construct the value of that type. So what we're saying with this is that it can either be debug or info or warn or error, or it can be unknown. And unknown is where we throw the string in if it didn't match one of these four things. This is still better than what we had before because the things that we're expecting, we have turned into types and people can use those expectations and they can probably gloss over the fact that it's unknown because there's nothing useful in there. If there's another useful thing in there, maybe we, maybe we add another constructor, or maybe we just throw away those entirely and we drop that constructor. This is just an example that you can have data in these constructors of the sum type, as well as just zero arity constructors. Uh, cool. Um, the, 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 the cool thing about this unknown string is that this, this severity from string function, from string to severity, is still total. We don't have to worry about that failing, which is a convenience, uh, and if you don't care. If you're going to ignore this branch anyway, then it probably doesn't matter too much. The things that you want to care about in your program are enforced with types. And the reason... What do you mean by a total function? Good question. Uh, a total function is one that can't throw an exception. Uh, there are other ways to make non-total functions, oh, they're still total functions. Not throw an exception is a definition. Uh, it, it, more, it means that for, that imp for every input, it has a valid output. Uh, we're going to get into ways later where we can kind of fudge the ability to not return a value, but it's still a value. It's a value that says there's no output, so we kind of cheat a little bit, but exceptions are the real problem. We don't want to do that. If we are in a spot where we can't match every case, we need to bring something additional into our types that says this thing could fail. Um, cool, cool. Uh, and we will, we will touch that in a bit. 
Uh, and the reason, the reason why some types aren't really enums is that the compiler knows that this is a closed set of constructors uh, that cannot be extended anywhere. So if I write a if I write a bit of code, this is one of the few bits of code that you'll see that just deals with debug info error, we will get a compiler warning uh, that says, "Hey, you haven't dealt with warning and you haven't dealt with unknown. You should really do that." And having the compiler there to test that you've exhaustively matched all possibilities at that point is really nice, especially when you start modeling errors or things like that with some types, because then everywhere that you are handling an error and trying to do something with it, like choosing whether you need to restart the transaction or resend the HTTP request, you have to deal with each additional case and make an informed decision rather than just letting it bubble up and explode or something like that. You'll get warned if you haven't dealt with, dealt with it, which is nice. It's kind of, when you start modeling exceptions like that, it's kind of like checked exceptions, except even exceptions aren't closed, so it's not really the same either. Uh, cool. Uh, yep, we, so we, uh, I haven't shown it, but if, if we get to our product, which we will in a few slides, we can now get to the point where we're dealing with a severity, which then communicates the fact that we have a closed set of options that we, we know we are willingly parsing out and you may want to do something with it. Um, there are a, a lot of sort of common some types for, uh, on that note, there are common product types as well. If anybody's ever used a, a tuple, a tuple is just a product type that isn't named. It's got a first, a second, a third, and a fourth, and just allows you to make an arbitrary product out of any n types. Uh, but as far as common sum types that are really useful for various things that we do with functional programming, maybe is a big one. Maybe is the way that we can say, we have, a, we have a type, this little a is just, we're writing this data type over any type a. Uh, and to construct a value of maybe, it can either be nothing and not have a value, or it could be just and have that value inside of it. So we use this as a, as a, as a null that's actually evident in the types. Uh, which is infinitely better to something like Java where you could just get null anyway, anywhere and have to aggressively check for null at every place of code. That's really not fun. It should be in the types. Uh, and we have either, which is just the choice between two different types. Uh, the common use for either is I either have an error, which is on the left-hand side, or the actual value of the computation. We, we, we'd use either of a maybe because we wanted to convey how it failed. We'd use maybe when there's either no value or a value, and there's only one reason for that, but we may use either if we have more than one, and we might want to communicate why, which I think we get into, but not yet. Um, another thing is called new types, uh, which is a way to add additional restrictions onto a, 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 an existing type. I think we, every project we write has some kind of NAT in it, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, like a natural number that is an integer but that cannot be negative will argue whether zero is part of that or not. But the one that I'm talking about is just we don't want negative numbers. Uh, say if we're indexing an array or something like that, we'd want to take a natural number. Um, so we can, we, can, we can write our... Uh, this has got a bit of extra syntax just so that if someone was reading the slides later, they can get the fact that we're... We're not exporting this constructor of natural. So the only way to construct a natural is through this from int function. Um, but our natural, our natural data type is really boring. It's just a single constructor with an int inside of it. As far as the structure goes, you don't. That's really boring, and you might ask, why would I do that? I just have another type in the way. But the reason for that is that we can now construct a function that will take an integer and maybe return a natural based on whether it was successfully a natural or not. Because um, then at this point, nothing can ever construct one of things, these things outside this module. So if we get a natural, we know it's a guaranteed integer that's uh, greater than or equal to zero. Is that, is that very common in your code? Uh, you, you know, is that a common trick or? Yeah, we seem to use that 
everywhere. We should really make it a library somewhere yeah, rather yeah. than just writing it everywhere. Like we do uh, with um, images, images have written quite many of those things. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah when, when I said that, I suppose I meant a lot of what look like really simple types, you know, simple data types. Yeah, yeah, I, we, I, we'll Your get to it. Is explaining yeah, that adding some additional restrictions on top, it's really simple, but the implications of this are really cool because you know every time you deal with a natural, that condition is satisfied and you don't have to worry about it from that point. Uh, I think we've talked about that or not. Yeah, and I guess the, the nice thing about here is we're talking about we're modeling that value with maybe, so it's following on from before. Uh, cool, cool. Um, Anything that's calling this from in now is aware that that could fail and have to deal with that. They either need to pass the maybe along and pass the buck, or they need to actually do something with it and say, hey, I haven't got a natural, this is a big problem, stop here. Uh, that, that is the kind of thing that we're trying to communicate to our callers and throughout the code, so that we can reason about the possible failure of this. Uh, cool. Uh, let me just skip, because you asked a question that kind of follows on to an, Another one. This is one we use everywhere. Oh, yes. uh, Non-empty list. A list that only has one element by construction. There is no way to have a list that is empty. Uh, and this is pretty simple. This is another really, really boring type. It is just data, non-empty list, or an A. And to construct it, we need at least one A, and there could be a list on the end. Uh, and we have our usual thing of from list. We can, we can take a list, and we maybe have a non-empty list based on whether it was null or not. Um, that's pretty cool because we there are so many places in your code where you're like, oh crap, I've got a list, but I really need an element. What do I do? Do I explode? Do I push that error up? And then it's got to bubble up through all my types. Doing this and encoding the fact that you need a non-empty list as your input communicates to your caller that they should really figure that out before they, they call you. I really, really need an element. So don't give me anything that doesn't just have at least one element, because I can't do anything. That's the world that we want to get to. But I'll jump back. Like if we, if they're putting it all together, our log, clean log line could get to a place like this, where we've tightened up the time, it's no longer a string, we actually have a data type for time, I'm not going to show the details of that. Uh, we using our natural for our system code, because it needs to be some uh, non-negative integer, it's a bit contrived, but whatever. Uh, and we have our sum type for our severity, so that something could pattern match on the severity and maybe filter it or paint it in red. Whatever they want to do, they've got it split up into types that they can then reason about, rather than going, what's in that string? I don't know. Um, and now we can, we can write our clean log line that is now from string to either of our long clean error, because from any string, there's not a guarantee that we get all of the, we get a successful pars of all these things. Logs are pretty dirty. Uh, that is either a log clean error or a successful log line, and we can model our log clean error that maybe we had an invalid time and we can't do anything at that point, and maybe we had a system code that was negative. Those kind of weird things, or maybe it wasn't an integer at all. There's a lot of things that could go wrong there, but here we're clearly well not all the things that could go wrong with the system code, but we're saying what went wrong and why we couldn't pass a log line, which if something needs that, it could be really useful. We tend to write code that does this by default so that if somebody needs it, they don't have to go digging into a string to pass out the extra information. We're trying to make the types as rich as we can. Uh, cool, we talked about non-empty list. Um, and I guess the, I guess the, Maybe it's crazy, but this is really just the start, especially with Haskell and PureScript. There's further that you can go with this. Uh, PureScript doesn't have GADTs yet. Is that? I don't think so. Um, no, but it doesn't. They're using existential. Right? Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's pretty powerful. In Haskell, you can do a lot of type level programming, that, and in Scala too, that can, you can make H lists that are hot. Uh, heterogeneous lists that do type level programming to say the first thing it's an int and the second thing it's a string. You can, the, the, the level, the glass ceiling to this is pretty high, so this is just the start. And we can talk about this as much as you want in BFPG, so if there's anything interesting there, let's talk about it. Uh, but not today. Um, 
But these simple things take us a really long way into just shaping our data types to be the minimum possible thing that we're, we're wanting. Like, we may use a non-empty list if we really, really need an element. Uh, we may take a maybe, we may return a maybe if it's not always there, that kind of thing. We can get a long way explaining the shape of our data just with those very simple things, which I think is really cool. Like, we write big data types over things like iframely responses and really nail down what's coming out of it. And when you start making your transformations of the data, the things that say, hey, this thing's a, a thing and I need to do something with it now, it just, it's a lot better when you have all your assumptions and shapes of the data encoded in the types ready for you to do the things you need to. Uh, cool. Um, and the, I guess the other nice thing about this is that it kind of brings a barrier to the edge of your code where you've kind of just got string here and from this point onwards you need to validate all that and make it into your richer types. That's the point where you kind of validate the world, make sure it's all good, and then the rest of your program doesn't have to worry about all the value cases. Um, that's a pretty nice place to be. Any questions at this point? Cool. How am I going for time? Um, there should be a number. Oh, uh, you're at 36 minutes. Holy shit. I'll go quick. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. I don't have too much more. Um, just. A few other things of how we can kind of weaken our, our functions and care less about the types that we're taking in. Uh, assuming that this thing's pure again, uh, what can this frizzle box do? It takes a list of A and then returns a list of A. Now, it doesn't know anything about A, so it couldn't, possibly couldn't construct an A. We don't have nulls, we don't have exceptions, so we can't cheat and create an A out of no anywhere. We, we, we have no ways to cheat and break the rules there. So does anybody have any ideas of what, what possibilities there are for this function? It could give you back an empty list. It could give you back an empty list. What really? else could it do? Give you an infinite list. Uh, in Haskell, yes it could. <laughs> what 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 element would ha would be in that? What what would the conditions of that element in the infinite list? It have would to have to be something that was passed in. Exactly. <sighs> At least I got this practice now. Um, if it could return an infinite list, shouldn't the input type be a non-empty list? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, yes, yeah. you could. Because you could give it an empty. Well, list. it could. And it can't create an empty. Well, yeah, you could create an empty. You just cycle yeah. on whatever. You're just give it. Assuming cycle is fixed, it's not. Implementation problems. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the simple fact that we have gotten to a place where we don't care about what the type of this list here means we can only do three things. The, the thing that must hold is that everything in the output must be in the input. We can't invent an A. So we either have to return the empty list, we need to return a list in the original order, that may be shorter than the original list, but it has to be in the same order because we have no way of reordering them, but we could have taken out the fifth one if there was a fifth one. Uh, or it could have been in the reverse order with a subset thereof. Um, we'd probably call this function reverse because that's probably the sensible thing to call this function, uh, which does make our intent clear, and it makes you a little sad. You're like, I, I have all these types, and, like, oh, why do I have to call this reverse to really convince somebody that it's reverse? But it's still nice for the caller to know that because you are using the most general type possible, you would really have to be malicious to make a, a weird function there. Like you'd be doing something very strange. So um, hey ben, how come I can't reorder the elements? Because yeah. uh, you don't have an ord. You don't have a way to order. You can you can order them arbitrarily. Yeah. Yeah, you okay. could. I could rearrange them in the list though, right? Yeah. I will swap the first and the seventh and the eighth and the eleventh. Oh, that is it. <laughs> yes, you could. Okay. Yeah, you could. Yeah, I suppose that's right. Yeah, you could. You would have to have a very arbitrary, and it could not be a random. You could not shuffle because you have no way. Yeah, I couldn't compare the elements. You couldn't compare right. anything. Okay. You can't sort. So it's it's like the set the set of elements in the output has to be equal to the set of elements. In the uh, so the unique, yeah, unique, yeah, subset. Yeah, subset. Yeah. 
Because yeah. you could duplicate. Yeah. 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 Because if you have one element, you could just return the infinite yeah. list of just one. Yeah. What else can we do? <laughs> Stop making us sadder. We don't have dependent types or anything like that. But we get a long way with, with weakening that function. Because um, um, if, you're, if, you're if you're writing a, a, a function that is over some kind of container that doesn't care about the type of that container, or it just takes an arbitrary value that doesn't care about the type of, it's said to be parametric. Um, and the way that I at least write code is that if you're not using parts of the information that you could possibly take as your input, even if you are hard-coded to string but you don't use the fact that it's a string, you should make it parametric because you should communicate to your caller that you don't care that it's a string. If they come back later and need to use it, pass an int in, you, don't, you suddenly don't care anymore. Um, that's a nice thing. You can get more code reuse and your caller has more power. Uh, yep, you could be you could get used for things that aren't even expected. Anybody who's coded in Java four can remember the pre generic days, and you don't you don't want to go back there. Good thing we don't have to do Salesforce programming anymore because it didn't have generics. Well, anymore. we're doing that sort of Yeah, even JavaScript's better than Salesforce. Um, uh, yeah, you're just giving you're giving your 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 caller a lot more power. Uh, that's that's the thing that I'm trying to get across here before we get derailed. Uh, but of course, there's a way to still be generic, at least in Haskell and PureScript, and to a lesser degree in Scala and ML. Uh, not really lesser, just a different a different way um, to take a generic type parameter, but have some kind of constraints over it, much like interfaces in Java. Um, in PureScript and Haskell, they're called type classes. Take the EQ and ORD classes, for instance, uh, where we have two type classes. We have, so this, this class definition here is just saying we want to make a class of type EQ uh, where it takes a single type parameter called A and to implement a type class of EQ for a particular A, you need to implement EQ, which is takes one A and another A and returns whether those two things are equal. Uh, board is the same kind of thing. Uh, if you're going to order things, you obviously need equality first, so there's a, there's a dependency upon the superclass, and it gives you the ability to compare. Compare is a sum type whether it's either less than, equals, or greater than. Um, and then at, at will, people can implement that type class for any data type that they want. And there's normally stuff that's already there for the things in the standard library, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're getting back to our list to list, but now we have for any A, we have an ORD constraint on A. And we're suddenly, we now, while we can work on any list of A, we, we, we're giving ourselves the ability to compare two things in these lists. Um, while still giving, giving our users the freedom to write their own data types and then implement board for that and pass it into our function. Uh, so in this, it's either going to be called sort or sort reverse, and we get a bit sad that we still have to name things, but that is okay. Come on. <clears throat> Fine. Um, but the, the, the thing that George, you have to take a drink now. <laughs> um, uh, the thing that really makes type classes cool, and we'll have a pretty neat example at the end, is that pretty much all the useful type classes have some kind of law that is unfortunately out of band to the types, but must be upheld to be a lawful instance of that type. Sorry, what did you say? Sorry? I didn't understand. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, so, it, to implement a, a specific type class, some of them have laws, which are properties that have to hold yep. for that interface. Yep. Uh, and what else did I say? Um, oh, there's something about like, you can't do something. It's up to you to make sure you're... Oh, yeah, it's oh, up, yeah. It's up yeah. to you to test that. Why is that? Because... It the, can't be enforced at We don't have dependent yet. types. There's yeah. a type is that what dependent types is about? Yeah. Well, we, could, we yeah. could encode that in a dependent type system. There's a really cool article that Dylan sent around of people in Liquid Haskell 
encoding the functor monad applicative laws in the type system, which meant an instance had to prove that those laws held before the instance was valid. We can't do that in Haskell or PureScript. Uh, the type system isn't that expressive. So it is kind of an out-of-band test case that we need to implement and promise that we're done, but it's, it's an established thing. It's pretty weird, I reckon. You know, you read, you read through yeah, it, your, your, you know, your Haddix and, and we've, got the def, we've got the laws in text. Yeah, I know, uh, I know. Well, no, what? Tony, would you like a burnt world that that, that wasn't? Well, I, yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just a trade-off, right? So if, if you were to put those laws in the code, you would incur a penalty. Right, so, for example, you, have, you could use a total language, um, the penalty would be in prototype with it. Like consider, for example, a law like um, the ORD type class compares two things um, coming out that they're equal, yeah. and implies that the equal instance should return true for those two things. Um, how do I put that sentence into a type? Um, and with Haskell's type system, that would be quite an effort. And it's still, it's, I would say it's still an open research problem in the dependently type languages. I yeah, because, because of the trade, right? Yeah. It'll be nice to be able to say it's all benefits when we do it, um, but we can't say that. Just like functional programming, we had to give stuff up to get there. People, I don't think people have figured out the sweet spot for the trade-offs. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And that's okay. Like we, we, We're obviously in the business of giving up some things to get benefit out of it. Uh, but the, the trade-offs are a bit too severe at the moment. Uh, uh, the, but if anybody is interested, there was a post that went around the EFOX chat the other day of people encoding these laws into liquid Haskell, which is a dependently typed <coughs> Haskell variant. So, so I can put that out to the mailing list. So come work for us at EFOX and you'll get access to that chat. Just <laughs> <laughs> open it up to the public, it's fine. Uh, cool. Uh, so yeah, when we're talking about functors, I'll quickly go through this because I'm sorry, I didn't think it would take this long. Uh, I should have practiced much more. Um, uh, but we, we do have two laws, which is if, so a functor is a thing. Uh, we need to gloss over the fact that this is a, something called a higher kind of type. Let's ignore that for now, we don't have time. Uh, but our functor is a container that has something inside it. We can see that here. Uh, which is, it's, it's, our f has an a inside it, and then we're returning an f that has a b inside of it. Um, it has a function that is called fmap, which if you've used pretty much any modern language, it's like list.map. You have a list of things, and you, uh, you put a function that is a to b, and then you go, the, the concrete instance of functor list would look like a to b, list of a to list of b. Uh, when we're talking about this type class, we're talking about it for any functor, so it's a bit more generic. But when we write a functor, these laws must hold. So f mapping the identity function must return exactly the same structure. Um, and f mapping the composition, oh, I put Haskell in a pure script talk. Damn. Uh, what a, <laughs> it's in a comment anyway. Um, <laughs> Like all laws, right? Um, uh, the composition of P and Q needs to be the same as F mapping P and then composing that with F mapping of Q. Um, and that, that's a bit vague, but all that really means is that our F map can't change the structure. It needs to run over every one of those A's, do its thing, return an alpha onto a B, and nothing can go missing. It's the quintessential argument of why a set is not a functor. Because if you have a set of 1, 2, and 3, well, a set with how we encoded in Haskell, but if you have a set of 1, 2, and 3, and you map const 1, you suddenly now have a set with just 1 in it. Because you obviously don't have duplicates in a set. Um, so this is really cool. And this might be the, the almost finale. We could skip the, uh, the effect tracking if we want. Uh, but Fuselbutt, our last Fuselbutt. If we are writing a function that works over any functor, and it takes an A and a functor of B, and returns a functor of A, what can that function do? What is the implementation of that function? It keeps the structure but gives you that A everywhere. Yeah. There is only one implementation of that function. You cannot possibly get that wrong and have it to type check. And that's really awesome. Like that's what we're trying to get to. 
And I, I, I find that kind of stuff really cool. Uh, and I just thought I'd end my ranting about type classes and laws with that, because I think mean, that's a pretty cool example. The, the implementation is, it needs to fmap const, which is just a, fun it's a function that takes a thing, forgets that argument, and just returns whatever this a is, and it gives you your function with that in it. Um, cool. We're late. Do we want to not talk about effect tracking? How are people? How many minutes you got? 50. Oh, I don't know. Here. I probably got about five minutes. Go for it. Ten minutes. I'll go for it. <laughs> it's up to everybody. Yep. Yeah. All right, cool. AKA, because you're going to get asked about it. What about this damn real world stuff? I've got to talk to databases and files, and then you're like, oh shit, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's what I said originally when I dealt with Haskell. Like, I'm like, how do I do this? It's really hard. Um, but our trick is instead of giving up and doing side effects in our functions and just having arbitrary side effects that aren't in our types, which we can do in Scala, and it's always a bad idea. <laughs> Um, we return an instruction of how to do that side effect instead. Uh, in Haskell, that's called I/O. Like the, you have an I/O of string, and that's a that's an I/O action that when you run it, it will give you a string in that context and do some stuff with it. Um, so instead of doing those side effects, uh, cool. It, it, what this gives us is it means that our function is still pure. Like if you if you think about the definition of being referentially transparent, for any input it still returns you back the same I/O action. Nothing that it can do in the pure context of its function body can do th anything different depending on what input you give it, which is is really nice because then we can we can we can uh, get, do the things that we were doing before where we give control to our callers to say hey. You might decide to run this thing zero times. You may decide to run it one times, or you may decide to run it forever. We don't care. We've given you the control over this. And instead of just doing a side effect and returning you something, we've given you an instruction that you can do further I.O. with. Um, and the coolest thing about this is that this effect is now part of the type system. Like, in your return, you are returning an I.O. of blah. And you can't escape this. Because you can't run one of these without cheating. Whoa! Oh, jeez. I've done a bad thing to One minute. Yeah. Much better. We want to see ponies instead, I'm sure. Uh, Give a talk on ponies next time. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> you get that enough at work. Hey, Anna. Does anybody know how to uh, shit, um, change tabs without being able to see the tab? Chrome, where are you? Is there a keyboard shortcut? To ch there is a shortcut. Control and numbers, I think. Control and numbers. We'll go through the tabs. There's oh. a control shift up and down that goes through the tabs. Oh, yeah? That should. Sure. Uh, control tab. Control tab. Control tab. Go through all the tabs. I think I think I hit the shortcut to close the door. One moment. Control shift T should open it. Control, control shift T. Alright. I'm glad we have people who are using their brains. Uh huh. That one and that one. Sweet. Thank you, Owen. You saved my talk. Um, you can't run these things without cheating. You can't run these things and unwrap them without cheating. You can, but it's kind of an escape hatch. You, you, you promise to never. There's like exceptions and coercing things. George will punch you down if you do that. Yeah. There's a swear jar at EFOX, and if you do that kind of thing, you need to put money in the swear jar. Um, but what this means is that our IO, once you're in IO, you can't get out of it. So you have this lovely effect where all these side effects are pushed to the outside, so you have this pure core that you can kind of reason more about. Because while our I.O. things are referentially transparent, that we still have to reason at each sequence of these steps that there are things in the outside world changing, and we need to think about that. In Haskell, that really sucks, because you just have this 
big I.O. thing and it goes off to the world, returns you a new world, and then you do something with it and you're like, what, what changed? I don't, I don't know what context this I.O. is in. And it's, it's a bit crazy. But in pure script, we have something called F and AF. F is the synchronous version of effects and AF is the promise-like thing. Um, you normally use AF more than you do F because... You, in JavaScript, so suddenly you have to call a window.set timeout just to stop blocking the main thread or something crazy. Um, so that becomes a real thing. Um, oh, there is another fizzle button. So this, this is pure script code. So this is not in the world of Haskell where all of our fix are just this random I.O. thing that we can't reason about. In pure script, we can have another fizzle button, which is for all things of A, and all the things of this effect, well, it's just F, but it's an effect down here. Uh, as long as we can show that A, we can, write a, we can write a function that takes that A and then returns you an instruction to do the effect that we want. And this effect is in a context of something called console. And then the, the, the result of that computation in that context is unit. What do people think that that is like the most important JavaScript function there is? It's kind of console.log, but just in a way that you have a show instance. Um, but that's really useful because if you if you see that in in your time, you're like maybe I don't care about that that effect all that much. You can you can make a distinction between an effect that is probably benign. The writing things in the console probably doesn't change the behavior of your program unless you're in crazy town. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Um, so you can you can you can make a you can make a, 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 a an educated decision as someone calling this function whether you're worried about that effect or not. Um, What's that vertical bar to do? Oh yeah, I wanted to gloss over that, but if you <laughs> don't ask this question, you will answer it. What this is the, this in here? This is something called a row type. So that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what we're saying is that this thing has a console effect, but this set of effects is open. So you can, you can, and we'll see it on the next slide, you can compose this with another F that has a different effect, and the result of the comp composition of those two types will be something that has console and the other effect. That's why they call it extensible effects. If you could only ever put console.logs on other things that are console.logs, it wouldn't be very fun. Uh, but this allows you to say, I'm okay with those effects growing, so you're fine to build that into a program that has other effects. And we see this these effect tags uniting together here. If we have something called Fusel pane, which obviously just gets the window uh, in the DOM effect context, in something it's a extensible effect that can be extended again, so it's it's open. Uh, we can. Forget the do notation, it's just a way to sequence these I.O. things together to say, I want to do this and do this, feed the result of that into this. But the result of this is now a function that works in DOM and console. So we can, we can now look at that and say, ooh, it's doing a DOM thing. Do I care about that more? Should I be concerned? Should I go check in the code to see what it's really doing? Which, you still have to load things in your head about what that function is going to do and whether it could break you. But you're a lot better off than when it's just I.O. of union and you don't even know whether it's a completely benign effect like console. So, I'd argue that this gets you in a much better place. Um, to anybody else who is a bit further ahead in this kind of thing, this kind of thing does not replace NTL. I want to make that abundantly clear. This replaces I.O. You can't replace things like reader and state nicely with this thing but it works very well as an IO replacement. And if you look in PureScript, it still has reader, writer, state, and reader, writer, state. It sits on top of these things. Um, so, just thought that was important. It's not like you, you throw out MTL because you have these cool things. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool. Conclusions. The uh, power that we get from FP is the thing that makes it weird. As we were talking before, we've given something up to get power. Don't be afraid of the weirdness. It's there for a good reason. In this talk, we've sadly had to hand wave 
how we go about creating these pure programs and how we write useful things in the context of these restrictions. This is too much to do there, and I think I've talked for an hour anyway, so we don't want me to talk any longer. But if anybody is interested in anything there, that's a really good thing for us to do BFPG talks on. So let me know. If there's anything that you're like, how would I do this? Just come chat to me, and we can do a talk on that, and hopefully enlighten people and all that kind of stuff. Because that's why we're here. It's not just for me to get up and rant and rave and be sad about some things. Uh, it, is, it is about teaching people, and I hope we can do that more and more. Uh, cool. Uh, so I hope I've given you some sort of appreciation of why we go to these troubles and why I, I'm so intent on getting us to a place where we just look at the inputs and outputs and reason about that and that only. Um, but with anything, like, if we have a, a language of things to restrict, if restrict something, that language is also really important, so we have to... We have to really lean on these types and get used to constraining our data to make it easy to reason about. It's, it doesn't help just having a pure function that is string to string, because that's a nightmare. Um, and we do things like effect tracking that just levels this stuff up. But it's all here for a reason. It may seem crazy. It may seem really hard. Um, and we even have to resort to naming things at the end and having laws that we test out of band but we're still getting to a much better place than we'd otherwise be. Because um, I'd much rather come to a rich type signature that has crazy generic parameters and type class constraints than like abstract Rufflecopter signal from factory. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to be in a world where I have to name things with ridiculously long names to convey my intent. There's a type checker there, we should use it as much as we can even though it doesn't get us to Nirvana just yet. It's still very cool. And I hope that motivates you to go learn. Uh, and come work for EFOX, if that even seems cooler. Because we will happily take people who don't know this stuff and teach them. You just need to be keen. We'll make it happen. So thanks. Are there any questions from that point? Or should we pack up and go to the pub? Just a better question more. Yeah. When you're talking about um, talks in the future. Yes. How long has it been since we've done a talk on reader, writer, state in Haskell? Probably, a, a, I think the last one was my talk. And that was, was that, in, that was in Scala though, wasn't it? No, I think it was. I think it was in Haskell. Oh, okay. I had the stacking your monads talk yeah. that had the Lego man, in it. and then George came and did the classy MTL talk. So. Yeah, um, that was like two years ago. Yeah, okay, so it has been a while. It has been a while. And I didn't even talk about free monads or anything like that. There are just, there's so much stuff to talk about. Uh, so, cool. All right, I think we're done. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, thanks to uh, Data61 and Tony for hosting us. Thanks to Efox and Pizza. Thanks for everybody for coming. Cool. Thanks.